Good morning. Good morning. And what a beautiful morning it is as we come to our Lord and Savior today to worship Him. I pray that today can be a day that uh, is revival, or renewal uh, for you as we get into God's Word. As we look at the activities today, we have small groups, various times and locations. We also have youth group tonight, uh, Wednesday uh, prayer service at 7 p.m., and then the Saturday uh, youth activity. And there are a number of items that you'll see going on in September. Uh, they're all in your bulletin or up on the screen, and I'll spare you uh, the time of going through each one of those just wanted to uh, say that uh, you may or may not have seen the landscape changed in front of the church uh, this week of the shrubs being pulled out that's all part of the landscaping plan and also part of making room to paint uh, the church and we're hoping to begin painting in September and complete the painting in the church and then we will see whether there is time uh, yet this fall to plant new shrubbery or if that waits until uh, this spring so just wanted to keep you all up to date on that plan and that is all I have for announcements please stand with me as we sing come thou almighty king Thank you for them. 
And now, Lord, we thank you for this church. We thank you for each one who's here today. And Lord, we may we come today expecting to be challenged by your word and maybe to be convicted of our sins and that we will purpose in our hearts and minds to have a closer walk with you. And Grace Father, we thank you for those who are in the leadership and serving in the children's program. We think of kids for truth beginning to start and ready to start. Grace Father, we thank you for those who are stepping forward to be the leaders. We thank you for those who are stepping forward to be assistance and to help. And may they have the joy this year of seeing young folk come to know you as Lord and Savior. Lord, that is our ministry. That's our job. That's why we're here to serve, to serve you after you have come and provided such a wonderful and precious gift of salvation. Grace Father, this morning we ask that you be with our pastor, give him the words, your words to speak, and Lord, may they touch our hearts. And these things we ask in your name. Amen. Isaiah 4, verses 2 through 6. In that day, in that day the branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the land shall be the pride and honor of the survivors of Israel. And he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy. Everyone who has been recorded for life in Jerusalem, when the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and cleansed the bloodstains of Jerusalem from its midst by, from its midst by the spirit of judgment, by the spirit of burning. Then the Lord will create over the land and over the whole site of Mount Zion and over her assemblies a cloud by day and smoke and a shining of flame of fire by night. For over all the glory there will be a canopy. There will be a booth for the shade by day from the heat and a refuge and a shelter from the storm and rain. Immortal, invisible, God only wise.
Exodus 3, 1 through 15. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father in law Jethro, the priest of Midian. And he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to the floor, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. He looked and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight while the bush is not burned. The Lord saw that he turned aside to see. God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not come here. Take off your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have truly seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of the land to a good and broad land, a land full of milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hittites, and the Jebusites. And now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, But I will be with you, and this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. For you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Holy, holy, holy.
Peter 1, verses 3 through 9. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining to the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Please stand with me as we sing, Be Still My Soul. Bibles to the book of Numbers, chapter 9. There are lots of trends online these days, and most of them are not worth the time that they take. But one that I have 
indulged in from time to time is reels or series, uh, series compilations of videos showing um, individuals in the military returning home and their families joy at uh, the return, especially surprise ones. Um, and uh, it's something that, that always lifts the heart to see what's going on there. Um, this sense of a person loved, long absent, and now returned is certainly a theme throughout God's Word. That theme begins in the beginning, when God made man to be with him, and there was a tragic loss of fellowship that we know very well in Genesis chapter 3. And as we've been looking through these first chapters of the book of Numbers, we've seen that God makes a way to dwell among his people, and those ways are different in different times, but all peoples of God have quite a lot of things in common as well. The point of all of this from beginning to end is to get us to the place where we are with God like he designed for us to be in the beginning. Not exactly like he designed us to be in the beginning, but like unto. That is to say that when God made Adam and Eve, he told them to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth because he had something for mankind to do in obedience and blessing with him. Now, Adam and Eve and their descendants don't have that as God first willed it anymore. But Jesus told his disciples that he is going to prepare a place for them and then that he will come again and receive them to himself so that where I am, he said, you may be also, and the implication is that we will never be separated again. It's wedding terminology. The bridegroom going away to prepare a home for his bride, and then when that is prepared, coming to take her so that they will be together always. In Revelation 20 and, excuse me, 21 and 22, we have a record of this event, well, a prophetic record of this event happening and what, some of what it will look like in those two chapters. But between the loss of that and the restoration of that, um, we've got all the rest of the Bible. So we've got Genesis 1 and 2, and we get Genesis, excuse me, Revelation 21 and 22, where everything's all right, and then everything else in between is dealing with the mess of Genesis 3 so we can get back to Revelation 21 and 22. Now, Revelation 21 and 22 are a little different than Genesis 1 and 2 because there's no more be fruitful and multiply. That is that at that time, the earth will be populated with peoples of God in all times who have, through their faith in him, shown that they accept his, his, his way of dealing with sin. And ultimately, that is through Jesus Christ. During those various times, God does make a way to dwell among his people, though not in the perfect way that we have in Genesis 1 and 2 and in Revelation 21 and 22. There are other ways that God, dwe that God dwells among his people. All of these other ways are sufficient. They are his sufficient will for us in these various times. And we'll talk about some of those times a little bit this morning. But God does not mean for that to be the only way that he dwells among his people. He has made another way that is again prophesied in Revelation 21 and 22, where we will be with him in his manifest presence, specifically with Jesus Christ. Numbers chapter 9, verses 15 through 23, are a record of one of the ways that God dwells among his people. It's not the only way. There are other ways that God dwells among his people. It's not the original way, and it's not the ultimate way that will come to pass one day. Instead, it is one of the ways that God comes to dwell among his people. It is supremely significant 
that God chose to do this in this way, and the record of it is magnificent. So let's read the passage and decide whether or not you think Numbers' record of it is magnificent, because we've got another account in the book of Exodus that we'll look at a little bit, Exodus chapter 40. Um, numbers is very numbers. Let's see what it looks like here. Uh, numbers 9, 15. On the day the tabernacle was set up, the cloud covered the tabernacle, the tent of the testimony, and at evening it was over the tabernacle like the appearance of fire until morning. So it was always the cloud covered it by day and the appearance of fire by night. And whenever the cloud lifted up from over the tent, after that the people of Israel set out in the place where the cloud settled down, the people of Israel camped. At the command of the Lord, the people set out, and at the command of the Lord, they camped. As long as the cloud rested over the tabernacle, they remained in camp. Even when the cloud continued over the tabernacle many days, the people of Israel kept the charge of the Lord and did not set out. Sometimes the cloud was a few days over the tabernacle, and according to the command of the Lord, they remained in camp. Then, according to the command of the Lord, they set out. And sometimes the cloud remained from evening until morning, and when the cloud lifted in the morning, they set out. Or if it continued for a day and a night, when the cloud lifted, they set out. Whether it was two days or a month or a longer time, that the cloud continued over the tabernacle abiding there, the people of Israel remained in camp and did not set out. But when it lifted, they set out. At the command of the Lord, they camped. At the command of the Lord, they set out. They kept the charge of the Lord at the command of the Lord by Moses. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, I pray for your blessing upon this time this morning. I pray that you would help me to speak your words and that the challenges and encouragements that are in this text and the others that we look at this morning would be appropriate and vital to our lives and that they would be things that we use to conform our hearts more to, to Christ and things that we use to build one another up and a way that we share the gospel with others as you bring them into our lives throughout this week. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I'm sure you noticed as we read through it that there were some phrases that showed up over and over again. At the command of the Lord is probably the most common one. And you also probably noticed that the main event, that is the tabernacle being covered by the cloud and by the fire, is woven throughout and is considered as a, con a thing which is connected to the command of the Lord. But the event itself and the unique information in this passage really are only in 15, 16, and 17, and then also kind of in verse 23. The rest of it, in a very numbersy kind of way, is simply making sure that we understand that there was no exception to this. Whenever the Lord told them to leave, they left. Whenever the Lord told them to stay, they stayed. And if it was a day, it was a day. If it was two days, it was two days. If it was a month, it was a month. If it was more than a month, then fine. However it was and whenever it was, God made his will clear to the people of Israel through the cloud that was over the tabernacle. And so this is, this is emphasized over and over in, in a very, very redundant, very clear, and very hedged in way so that, so that there can be no misunderstanding of just exactly what is going on here. Now we're going to approach and apply this text from a couple of different perspectives this morning. First we're going to go, we're going to see what's going on here and then what I'd like to do is I'd like to track some of the manifestations of God's presence in the tabernacle and through the Ark of the Covenant and in the temple through the rest of the Bible because this event is the beginning of something and I think if we track what is happening here and what goes on throughout, we're going to see some significant things. Now, here we have the Exodus event, an event that occurs during the Exodus. And what happens here in Numbers 9 is not strictly chronological with the rest of the book of Numbers or with the rest of some of the parts of the Pentateuch. For instance, it seems unlikely that the deaths of Nadab and Abihu in Numbers chapter 3 could have occurred before this, because God's presence wasn't in the tabernacle until this event, even though their death because of lighting strange fire occurs a number of chapters previous. All right? So I just want us to have that in mind, because we're going to be referencing back to Exodus chapter 40, which I think is a more detailed explanation of 
verse 15, which simply says, on the day when the tabernacle was set up, the cloud covered the tabernacle, the tent of the testimony. At evening, it was over the tabernacle like the appearance of fire until morning. And that brief verse is more or less in detail unpacked in Exodus chapter 40. So, we've got not necessarily a strictly chronological thing here. Instead, the book of Numbers is focusing in detail on specific ideas that need to be brought across. The first set was in chapters 1 through 6, and then we've got another set that we're working our way through here uh, in 7 through 10. Whatever the chronological issues here are, and they're not, it's not a big issue, this moment, this event, is the thing toward which Revelation has been building for a long time. I mentioned that God dwells among 